Good day. I'm Maurice Coleman. And I'm Paul Signorelli. I'm Esra Nawar, and in this podcast, we discuss all things information science with our noted guests. And today, we're fortunate to have with us Cindy Hull, Director of Policy Analysis and Operational Support of the Kansas City Public Library and the incoming president of the American Library Association. Cindy is an e- holder of an MBA and MLIS, and she's a member of the Santee So Nation and works as the director um, at the Kansas City Public Library. She's a past president of the American Indian Library Association. She works with librarians to share information across the globe as a member of the International Federation of Library Association, IFLA. In her role, she serves as an ex officio trustee on the executive board of the Freedom to Read Foundation and as a member of the Missouri Library Association Intellectual Freedom Committee. As a proud ALA Spectrum Scholar, she strives to increase diversity in the library profession through her mentorship, recruitment, and advocacy. She holds a Bachelor's of Science and three other master's degree. Her Master's of Library and Information Sciences is from Wayne State University. Cindy, welcome to our show. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity. Before we start, as our very first question to you, Cindy... And this is the Information Go Wild podcast brought to you by the San Jose State University Information School. What brings you happiness? I have three little girls and every day is a new day, a new adventure in our home. So I love seeing the world through their eyes and hearing about the stories of their day at school, learning more about pop culture and everything that is important to them and always keeping them involved in all of their activities. So I absolutely love being a parent. It brings me great joy each and every day. And it's something that fulfills my purpose in this life. I also really love my work. I love librarianship. And so I, I'm pretty much a very happy person. One of the first things we wanted to explore with you, what are some of the key skills and experiences leaders in information science need to develop to be successful? And feel free to tie that back to how you work with your family, too, if you want to do that. Sure. Well, I think that communication is a very important skill for any working professional to be able to hone. When you converse with others, whether it's individually one-on-one or you're addressing a group or you're standing on stage in front of thousands, you want to make sure that you are reading the room, you're delivering a succinct message, and that you're always using an appropriate tone so that everyone understands exactly what you're there to share for that moment. I think that communication is always going to be that game changer skill that helps you leverage your career. The other thing that leaders really need to look at is making sure that they have strong emotional intelligence. And that's something that is a soft skill that you can continue to develop over time. It's something that you learn through life, It's something that you can read about and definitely something that you can practice. So I always encourage people to follow thought leaders who like to speak on the topic of emotional intelligence and just help us all learn and grow together. It's something that leaders really need to be cognizant of. And then the most important part of leadership is making sure that you have strong public speaking skills. And oftentimes when we're in school, we don't always take that communications course. We don't always have a course that covers this. But what we need to remember is that we're all human beings living this human life together. And that while it may seem intimidating to stand and speak in front of others, it's something that you can practice. And so there are always tips and tricks as to how you can become comfortable in that setting. But I encourage everyone to practice just one-on-one. And if you don't have someone that you're comfortable practicing with, start with a stuffed animal, start with a pet. Just make sure that you are not only developing key messages that you wanna share, but have an elevator pitch as well so that you can be effective in your communications. Cindy, I love that so much. I I struggled 15 years ago with my own public speaking, and I remember I I failed tremendously in my first presentation, but um, I I applied exactly what you just said, and I actually enrolled myself uh, in Toastmasters, 
which was super helpful um, to, to practice in front of people and have these conversations. And as you said, rehearsal, rehearsal, rehearsal is something that I've definitely learned through the years to, to have those key messages. Uh, so thank you for sharing that story. I, I love it. And um, I'm also a mother of three. So that kind of warmed my heart that you um, started the, the podcast today with speaking about your girls. Uh, but one of the things that we want to talk to you about in, in your leadership is what what are the things that actually developed you as a leader in specifically in our field, the library and information science? When I started working in libraries, it was my opportunity to change careers, actually. So librarianship is my second career. And I was recruited to the Topeka Shawnee County Public Library to work with Gina Melsap and Rob Banks. And they are two phenomenal library leaders who I admire and look up to. And when I was able to make that transition, it was something where they encouraged me to just jump right into it and immerse myself in librarianship. And I was so grateful for that opportunity. So really just learning all about the field was something where each and every day I was in the library, out in the community, making sure that I understood what is the role of the library? And how can I best serve our community, my colleagues, all of our wonderful staff and volunteers, and help everyone know about the story of the library? So it was something where it was a brand new experience. I considered it an adventure, and I really hit the ground running in learning everything that happens daily in a public library setting. So at that particular library, it's this beautiful main building where they have thousands of visitors each and every day. They have this robust bookmobile fleet that brings services and programs and materials out to the community. They cover a 550 square mile radius. So it is a rather large county. And so when you're looking at librarianship at that, at that level, it's something where you just continue to learn new ways to serve. And I was very inspired from my time there. There were so many wonderful programs. They had 3,600 programs a year, half that were in-house and half that were through outreach services. And so by just immersing myself in that experience, I knew that this was going to be a great fit for me and that I, I already knew that I loved libraries and that working in one was going to be a great fit. So that's really when I decided to pursue my master's of library and information science degree. I wanted to make sure that I had the same educational foundation as my colleagues and that I learned how librarians were trained. Yeah, I think a lot of us actually fall into this this wonderful profession uh, without really knowing what it is from the outside. And I think that podcast actually will help a lot of people know more about librarians, librarianship and what kind of work we do on a daily basis. So thank you for sharing that story. Cindy, what are some of the greatest challenges you face as a leader in our field? Well, you know, I think with anyone really, you're limited by your time. And so you need to be very effective with your time management skills. You need to make sure that you are in the places you need to be and that you are moving into the spaces in which you want to grow. For me, I'm a very goal-oriented person. And so I always want to make sure that I have my objective set and that I'm tracking my progression to make sure that I am going to achieve those goals. To me, that motivates me as a person. Um, I always want to be able to learn how best to serve others. And so sometimes it really depends. You know, the challenge could be that at that moment, there's only one of me and there's 10 library locations, or there's only one of me and there's, you know, 55,000 ALA members. So you really need to take it in stride. No two days are going to be the same in this field. It's something where, while yes, you can develop a routine and you can know your tasks in and out, you can you know, be an expert in a subject matter. You can do the best job you can every single day, but we will always have challenges that come up. So really it's very important that we learn how to be versatile. And by having that strength, you are able to respond in the best way that you can in that moment. There will be no two interactions that are the same, but what we can do as a librarian, as a leader, is to just show up in the best way that we can and listen for understanding. So whether that challenge is with a colleague and they're needing support, that's what the leader is here to do, is to listen and to provide that feedback, to understand what it is they're needing and to provide them with that support so that they can be successful in their work. 
because we're all in this together. That's the beauty of librarianship is that information flows freely among us and that we're here to share information and help everyone continue to grow within the profession. So if our challenges are with our community and we're limited in our resources and that's the reason why we can't you know, do another program series or we can't continue to expand hours of operation or even grow within size. You know, we need to be realistic in, in what we, in how we make the decisions that we do so that everyone understands what the role of the library is and how we can help. And then most importantly, if we have challenges from outside of the library itself, whether that be from another field and those are just matters that are outside of our control, we need to remember that we are going to take this one day at a time. Librarians are very good at planning. We're very good at understanding the limitations and being creative with our decision making so that we can do as much as we can within sometimes limited resources. So it's something that if we look at the challenge together, we can come up with a good solution. And I always encourage leaders to continue to network and build that, that community outwards within the field. Because while you are serving locally, you do have strength in numbers nationwide. And so that's why it's so important that we continue to, you know, make these connections and to just put ourselves out there and offer our support so that when challenges arise, we remember we're stronger together and, and we got this. It's a wonderful description to our students and our peers out there as to the challenges we face and how to overcome them. Can you think of a story that illustrates that for you so that we just nail this by, oh, yeah, I'm going to remember that because this is what you experienced and this is the result of it? There's always challenges where sometimes you feel like you survived it <laughs> and it could have been a really stressful moment for a minute there. Um, and then there's other challenges where it seems like they just keep building over time. And you know you have to address it at some point, but you're going to see if there's a factor that changes it. So when I look at specific challenges within the library field, I'm often looking at the lack of resources that we sometimes have. And so it's so important that as we continue to advocate for our needs in our community, our information needs, and how everyone should have equal access to information, that we are not afraid to ask for funding and support. Think of one challenge you've seen in Indian country where there was a funding challenge and the community got together, either with your involvement or something you observed, how that played out. When we gather together and we're having conversations and we hear that a library has a specific need, that's when we can all work together to see what's available in regards to resources and how we can support, whether it's our time, whether it's in-kind donation, or whether we're connecting people and helping them grow their network through our relationships. So it's something where, like um, in tribal libraries, a lot of times you are very limited in your resources. You may have a zero operating budget. And when I tell people that, they often don't understand that. They say, well, how can an organization exist if there isn't any funding? Well, it depends. So if there is a building and there's a collection and there's people who work there and those salaries are, are covered under an operating budget, but there isn't anything additional for programs and services, you need to become very creative in how you provide service to the community. And so in doing that, you ask your other librarians, hey, I saw you had that great literacy program for young adults. Can you tell me how you got funding for that? Hey, I saw that you were able to give away books to preschoolers. Where did you get that collection of books from? You know, asking people, how did you continue to grow in services? So within the American Indian Library Association, um, we have this term that we use called cousin libraries. And so in a lot of Native families, we're very large in size, and we have a lot of cousins. And so in the mainstream, you'll often hear like sister cities and, you know, maybe even sister libraries. But in Indian country, you know, cousin libraries, that's, that's just immediately understood. This is your cousin. And so, you know, with our relations, we're all related, and we're always going to remember that. And so you want to make sure that everyone has what they need. No one goes away unserved. And so if you have a cousin out there in need, you know that you're going to help them. 
And so I would encourage any public library, any academic library to cousin with their local tribal library if they could, or any smaller rural, rural library. There are libraries all across this country, over 17,000 strong, and so many of them lack resources at certain times, whether it's certain time of the year or if it's year over year, and it's something that really needs to be addressed. But there's always going to be opportunities for us to share ideas, give free webinars so that people can access these without you know, having that, that paywall barrier. That's something that can also be helpful. I love that, Cindy. Cousin Libraries. I'm going to steal that from you and quote you at some point. But before I ask you the second, the the next question is, I want to go back to something that you said that I think um, should definitely be taught in school. Listening. You said listen to understand, not instead of listening to respond, which is something all of us struggled with. Struggle with, um, despite of you know we claim that we're good listeners, but then you you look back at yourself. So I wanted to share t- with some of our audiences here a, a, a course that I'm actually enrolled in called Listening to Engage, Empower, and Influence. Um, it's it's just a video. It's actually free online. Speaking of diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's a free resource, but it's super helpful. And I and I think all of us as leaders in our areas in our profession, and and I loved what you said about listening and listening to understand. So thank you for sharing that tip. Um, but as you go ahead and begin your uh, long, year long term of office as president of uh, the American Library Association, the biggest library association in the world, what do you need from us, from your colleagues uh, and peers uh, to help you succeed in this year? Thank you, Esra. That's a wonderful question. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up listening because that's that's my answer. Um, you know, mm-hmm. the creator gives us all two ears, and that means we should do twice the listening before we respond. But truly, listening to seek to understand, that's what helps bring us together as a people. The beauty of our diversity is our strength. And as long as we give everyone an opportunity to share their voice, that is what's going to connect us and build those bridges. When we are able to listen to one another, to hear what the needs are, to celebrate our successes, to learn how to continue to grow and serve within our own careers and communities, that's really what the ALA is here for. The American Library Association is this, you know, the the largest library association in the world, but it's one that is so near and dear to my heart. Because when I joined this field and I applied for the Spectrum Scholarship and I was awarded that, I, I couldn't believe it. That was the first time I had ever been awarded a scholarship. And, you know, I was several degree programs in at that point. And I was, I felt so welcomed. And that's really where I felt my immediate fit within ALA. Joining this large association, there were so many different divisions, chapters, roundtables. And, you know, I I didn't exactly know where to begin. But I knew that I was a part of the Spectrum community. And so I went to our Spectrum meetups that we had. I attended our webinars and wanted to make sure that I understood that there was a community there that I was a part of and I was welcome there and that's where I belonged. And so that's really how I started my journey with an ALA. And so I encourage students ever to find their fit in librarianship. And if it's not at the biggest level to start locally, I encourage our students of color to connect with all of the ethnic affiliates that are out there, the National Librarian of Color Groups, We have the American Indian Library Association, the Asian Pacific American Library Association, the Black Caucus of ALA, the Chinese American Library Association, and Reforma for the Spanish speaking as well. So there are so many different associations that exist as affiliates of ALA, and there's your state and local chapter, as well as affiliate chapters. And so there's a lot of different ways that we can all support one another. But during this year, I am so grateful for the opportunity to be able to help support librarians across this field and to be able to understand how we can learn and grow together. And as challenges that rise in your area, I would love to hear from anyone to see how I can support and help. And the role of ALA isn't to just come in and take over on anything. We're here to offer support to you. So We will support your state chapter. We will support you locally. We'll do what we can to help you get the answers that you need. But this 12 months is going to just fly right by like it always does. 
and we're going to do the best that we can. I'm so excited to work with my advisory committee. I have 13 members who are wonderful librarians across this country, and we're really looking forward to being able to serve our members. Sydney, as a member of the Santee Sioux Nation, you just talked about inclusion. You mentioned various groups in ALA as a really inclusive body. A very big part of inclusion is nomenclature and language. Is there language that we as non-Native American tribal members, et cetera, could use to make folks that we come in contact with feel more welcome? Sure, that's a great question. Thank you. You know, with anything, it's it's important to see the person. You know, when you're when you're with someone in maintaining maintaining that eye contact, you know, just you know, as you introduce yourself, hi, I'm Cindy. Um, you know, I'm Dakota of the Santi Sioux Nation. It's nice to meet you. If someone has a question, I am always open to answering that question. And so, in this country, we have. 567 federally recognized tribes. That means that these are sovereign nations. And for me, I say I'm Dakota. And if I'm going to be specific, I say I'm of the Santi Sioux Nation. And depending upon what community I'm in, I, you know, I may change how I introduce myself. If I am in a community event, there's protocols that we go through when we introduce ourselves. And so we have our our regular protocol that we go through. When we introduce ourselves, we use our language. And so that's something that it really depends on what community I'm in. But when you talk about nomenclature, it's something where, you know, you really just need to ask the person, what is their personal preference? How may I refer to your identity? And something, you know, I, I would hope that most people would welcome that question um, and that they would be happy to answer that because it's always better to ask beforehand than have to correct a mispronunciation or you know make sure that someone understands exactly how you wish to be recognized. That's such a nice view of that because it's, I don't know why it's taken so many of us so long to just get to that basic, how do you pronounce your name or how should I address you? seems like until we really start focusing on diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice as an issue, a lot of us were just tone deaf to that. Moving beyond the nomenclature thing, what do our students and our colleagues in the information field need to know and to better collaborate with groups that are such an essential part of your day-to-day work? So, you know, if you're wanting to build relationships with tribal libraries, um, it's always so important to just reach out and to ask for a meeting. Um, In a lot of Indigenous communities, we prefer face-to-face meetings because that's really a way that you can understand someone else. A lot of what we do is looking at those nonverbal cues and making sure that um, we're being respected in our space. And so, you know, there's no two tribal nations that are the same. We all have different language, culture, food, dance, traditional regalia ceremony. You know, there are so many different ways um, that people are people. And so it's important that if we have librarians who are working adjacent to a tribal community who has a library and they would like to build a relationship, that they reach out to the librarian. And I always want to encourage people to learn more about that community that they also serve. Um, The other thing that is important to know is that you don't have to be an tribal member to work in a tribal library. There are plenty of people who serve in library in tribal libraries who live outside of the community and they they drive in. So there are different people who work in libraries as we know all across this field. But if you're wanting to connect with your local tribal librarian, it's something where you know just you just reach out to them, you invite them to have a meeting with you. Um, Again, making sure that you're respectful of their time, understanding that a lot of times they wear many hats and that they have a very small staff, depending upon the size of the community. So while you may work in a well-funded institution, that doesn't necessarily mean that the smaller rural community has the same access to resources. So if this is a time where you're wanting to support them in a certain initiative, you know, absolutely let that be known. 
um, say, hey, you know, we, we have this great grant opportunity and we're wanting to collaborate on this literacy program, you know, whatever it is that you're working on. But letting them know that you see them and that you appreciate the work that they do and recognizing that you also serve the same community. Because as we know, Indigenous people are everywhere. And we don't all just go to one certain library. You know, a lot of us live in urban settings now. And, you know, when I'm back home, of course, that's a different experience. And I know how everything goes there. But when I'm living in an urban area, I have to find my community. And when I moved to Kansas City, I really had to do that. And so locally, or luckily, we have a local Indian center. And I was able to connect there with the, the other people who enjoy the services and the community that is built within that setting. And then we're also lucky that we live close to Haskell Indian Nations University down in Lawrence, Kansas. And they're not too far and they have a wonderful librarian there, Kiri Cornelius, who is Oneida Potawatomi. And she does so many wonderful programs for students. And you know, the unique thing about Haskell, if you're not familiar, is that they have students from all across Indian country. So I think this semester they had over 150 different tribes that are represented that are currently there. And so, you know, when you're wanting to build a relationship with a tribal library, it's something where you just call them up, ask to meet, and you show up in a good way. Uh, Cindy, you've uh, erased a lot of misconceptions. And if you, you've educated me myself, uh, um, I might have shared that with you um, before the uh, podcast recording. I'm originally from Egypt. And I kind of, even though metaphorically, I mean, despite of the differences, of course, uh, metaphorically, um, I'm just going to give that example a lot of people assume that Egypt is part of the Middle East, that the Middle East is all the same, right? And 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 I kind of related to your story about like the tribes have different um, customs, dances, sometimes food. And, and, and I love that you are educating the students about this because someone like myself who grew up outside of this country, um, I didn't know much about uh, the tribes and uh, the, the Indian nations and um, how they're served and how uh, libraries in the Indian nations are cousin libraries. This is just so, so beautiful. And I think it's really important work of d diversity, equity and inclusion work that sometimes gets um uh, really ignored or maybe not focused on, but I'm definitely committed into uh, bringing to life some of these stories and perhaps work with you through your new uh, role in ALA. Um, but uh, going to uh, leading this, this this is leading us to the other question is, what are some of the biggest challenges our students right now and peers face in working effectively with the groups and communities that are near and dear to your heart? The biggest thing is there is a lack of representation within the within librarianship in the entire field. And so when we're looking at building community and trying to help people grow within the profession, it's important that you have a network there. And so I do encourage students to seek out those groups where they feel that they would be comfortable, where they I hope where they know that they're welcome and definitely where they feel like they could be long. And for me, that was the American Indian Library Association. When I joined the field, I immediately joined AILA and I, I definitely connected with library leaders that were serving within AILA at that time and started reading their newsletter and looking at their website and just you know seeing uh, the different resources that were available to students. So, I'm someone who, when I see there's an opportunity for us to do better, I'm always going to do my part in helping make that happen. And so it, when I was president of the American Indian Library Association, we partnered with several institutions that were also committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, social justice, and anti-racism practices within the field. And we sought out an IMLS grant and luckily we were awarded that grant and it is called the Bridging Knowledge Scholarship where we have 15 indigenous students. They are Native American, Native Hawaiian and Alaska Native at San Jose State University. And they are currently there obtaining their MLIS degree. To hear that we could have 15 more indigenous librarians joining the field is something that's so exciting to me because the big message I did hear when I started was that, oh, you're a one percenter. And I said, what does that mean? 
And these, I, I heard several colleagues say, well, there's only 1% of Native Americans that are represented in this field. And to me, that immediately said, here's an opportunity. Here's something that I can do to help change that. Because I, I loved libraries my entire life. And I was really enjoying working in the library that I was at. So I thought, you know what? This is an opportunity for us to help bring other people into the field as well. Because as we see the retirements that happen from librarians who've served a great career and, and they're moving on into that next transition, we need to have as many librarians who are trained and ready to go and they have their new credentials. So it's definitely something that as a leader, we need to listen to our students. We need to encourage people to become students and help support them in that educational endeavor. As we know, scholarship is only part of it. We have to be mentors, supporters, and friends as well. So I would hope that students know that no matter where they're at in their journey, whether they're still considering school or they're in it, that there are definitely communities that are available within this field and, and mentors who are here to support. If we can, Sydney, let's take a, a look at the role mentorship has played in your professional development. You talked about the positive impact your mentors have had on you. Drawing on that experience, can you provide our listeners with tips on what goes into great mentoring? You know, mentorship is really something that you have to be passionate about. You have to want to invest your time into helping support others, be the best that they can be as well. And it's so fulfilling when you are meeting with your mentee and you're having these one-on-one -on -one discussions that you're able to share not only lessons that you learned along the way, but helping them see how you're learning from them, that there is this reciprocity. And that's something so important in an Indian country. That's something that Indigenous people, we rely upon. Relationality, reciprocity, and respect. And so when you can have that relationship with someone, I'm hoping that it's going to be lifelong. I'm hoping that you'll check in. There's always an ebb and flow of your life and within your career. But as you go along that spectrum, Hopefully you're touching base and you're reaching out to your mentees. Hopefully you're seeking out a mentor yourself because we always have opportunities to learn. And I'm someone as a lifelong learner, I always want to continue to grow. If there's a new area of librarianship that I want to familiarize myself with, I will look people up. I'll see who's writing about it, who's presenting on it, who's researching it. And I'll reach out to them and ask them, hey, can I have 10 minutes of your time? I just want to learn a little bit about what you're working on and then just see where that goes. You know, for a mentor-mentee relationship, the time that you invest in that is always going to be returned to you tenfold. It's something where you're going to continue to grow and lead and learn together. So I encourage you, Ryan, take that time to develop your own perspective, because as leaders, we always have opportunities to give back to others. And that's the other thing in Indian country. We don't talk about um, ladders or like you're, you're ever going to step up above anyone else because we're always in a circle. We're always connected. We're always in service to one another, hand in hand, side by side. So for my community, we don't talk about how you elevate. We talk about how you grow in service with one another. So for mentors and mentees, I encourage them to continue to grow together. I mentioned earlier in our conversation today, Gina Millsap is somebody that you learned a lot from. And I remember our conversation we had a few months ago when we were at the American Library Association Library Learning Experience event. And your eyes just lit up when we started to talk about Gina as somebody who was a great mentor. Can you tell stories about the relationship you had with Gina that illustrates the important role she played in your life and what you picked up and passed on from that? Oh, absolutely. So like, as I said, uh, Gina hired me and, you know, she took a chance on a casino marketer who did not have a background or education in libraries. And I will share that my husband is a second career or I'm sorry, second generation librarian. And when I met him, he was going to go to library school and his mom was a school librarian. And so he always knew what he wanted to do in his career and I supported that, but I was firmly in the casino box. That, that was, you know, what I did, that's what I loved. Um, and so I 
was intrigued by this customer experience manager position that they had posted. And my husband encouraged me to apply and I did. And I met with Gina and Rob and, you know, we had a three hour discussion. I didn't feel like it was an interview. Um, we just kept on talking about just all, all of the similarities really between public service. So between casinos and libraries specifically, but when I started working with Gina, she was so generous with her time. You know, I had a meeting with her every other week. I always, you know, would ask her questions. She would send me different, you know, articles, um, different podcasts to listen to, different blogs to follow. Um, she's just a very giving person. And so I really respected her as a leader and the way that she led our team. And so she's definitely someone that I admire and look up to. And I'm so grateful for all of the information that she shared with me. And, you know, when you work with a selfless leader like that, someone who feels that the time they share with you is an investment, not only in you, but in their career, that's a very positive place to be. And so I really enjoyed my time there. Um, it was a bunch of uh, fun, loving people who, you know, they were passionate about librarianship. They were committed to serving the public and to just, you know, showing up in a good way and doing the best that we could every day. And so when you have a phenomenal leader like that, um, it, it's such a gift. And I felt like learning from them, continuing to grow within the organization that obtaining my library degree was just a natural next step for me. And it was with their encouragement that I continued on this path. I know that they leveraged my career by investing in me, all with sharing their time. Whether it was through daily lunches, emails, or check-in meetings, they were very welcoming to me. And I am I will always be grateful. Thank you so much. I hope that the students that are listening to this understand this isn't just us theoretically talking about this. This is you looking down the road when you are in the position that Gina was in and that Cindy's in now. You want to be that mentor to the people that you're going to work with. And conversely, while you're looking for mentors, look for that kind of person. And mm -hmm. our other peers in this who are current mentors, great guidance, folks. Hope that this re-inspires you to do why you're doing what you do. Yeah, I love this. It's, it's very heartwarming. Uh, I've had great mentors as well that I'm grateful to and very, very similar stories about sharing resources. Uh, and I try to to pay it forward because um, you you want the profession to be strong and you want the profession to continue to have uh, librarians and library professionals and people, library supporters and paraprofessionals that are giving and have their hearts and minds uh, into the profession. But from Gina's story, what do you think we're not doing right in mentorship that we could do better to support the lifelong learning needs of our peers, of our students, our colleagues? Well, I think that we could always commit to supporting every single student in library school, whether that's through a formal mentorship program or an informal one where you're just checking in with your staff. As we know, for those of us who have obtained the library degree, it's a rigorous program. And oftentimes students are going through school while they're also working. And so it's so important that we're asking them, what are you working on? How can I support you? What is a fascinating area of research that has really piqued your interest? Where do you wanna grow? It's important that we show that we understand not only the time commitment and all of the responsibility that they're, they're currently holding, but that we share, we share that respect because we also went on that journey and we understand what it takes. So a little bit of a encouragement can go a really long way. And just checking in with someone and letting them know, hey, I know it's finals week. Is there anything I can do to help you? You know, even as a leader, it's something where you could just give them a little thank you note for their service to the field, for their commitment to the profession. Give them a little snack basket. You know, do mm -hmm. these little things that bring comfort to someone and continue to encourage them to fin cross that finish line to, to obtain that degree. You know, that's the one thing about education. No one can ever take that from you. It will never diminish your who you are as a person. It's something where the time that you give to your education is something that is going to have that higher return on investment. So I encourage students, even though you may want to spend other 
weekends with friends and, you know, going on trips or doing other things that the time you spend on researching and studying and writing is just going to make your career so much more fulfilling. Uh, but despite of the efforts uh, uh, that ALA and ACRL and all those amazing organizations uh, have been have put together to diversify the profession. Um, according to the statistics that are public, eighty three percent of the profession are still you know majority of white people, which I have no problem with. But it it doesn't seem that those diversity efforts have been successful enough. Um, and I was talking to a couple of people this morning. Um, uh, in their nursing profession, and we're writing a paper together, trying to see whether it's a it's a data problem or it's a pipeline problem. And you've been in a profession long enough, and now you're going to be the leader of ELA for a year. I'd love to just take you know get your take on it. What do you think is the problem? Well, you know there are many factors that impact why there is a lack of diversity within the profession. For me, I didn't see myself as working in a library. I've loved libraries as soon as we moved to the city. When I was little and we were on the reservation, we didn't have a public library. So when we moved to the city, uh, that's the first time that we got to go to the public library. My mom would walk us there every Saturday. And it was this magical world that opened up to me. But I had that relationship as a reader and as a lover of libraries. So when I was recruited into the field, you know, that's what it took. It took a librarian recruiting me into the field for me to see myself in a place where I felt like I could belong, that I could serve, that I could continue to learn and grow. And so it took that introduction. When my husband brought me the job description, he said, look at this cool job we're looking for. And I read it and I said, wow, I didn't know libraries cared about that. I love that. I said, this is why you guys are such a great library. And at that point, I had been on their softball team for a few years, so I knew some of the staff, and they were all great. Um, I just didn't see myself working in libraries. You know, I was in casinos. That's I love the action and being on the floor with thousands of people, giving away cars and emceeing events, and that's really where I thought I was going to be. And so it really took that invitation. So I would encourage leaders, if you have an acquaintance, a friend, a neighbor, a student that you know of that maybe doesn't have a definitive major who maybe is thinking about changing their line of work, plant that seed because you never know. Someone else might water it later down the road, mm -hmm. but it's, it's something where you need it. Sometimes you need an invitation. You need somebody to tell you, do you know that there's an opportunity here and that I think you would be great? I, ha I was lucky enough to have that. And then to have a supportive leadership team who also agreed that there was a place for me in this field. To be the first Spectrum Scholar elected president of the American Library Association is something that I still haven't wrapped my head around. Yeah. When, you know, we're almost 25 years into that scholarship program and, you know, we have thousands of graduates. And so when you think about over 17,000 libraries, well, unfortunately, we don't have 17,000 Spectrum Scholars. You know, we have 1,700. So when you look at scale, it's something where we're always going to need to build those relationships and help people see the value of working in this profession. And that truly information is for everyone. And that equality matters. Everyone should be able to see their fit in libraries, to see themselves growing in this field, to have a successful career path forward. Sometimes it takes us sitting at those career fairs, going to schools, sharing information online through social media, just putting up bulletin boards in our own libraries. Hey, we're hiring. You know what we're looking for? You know, helping staff see, hey, you know, do you have a friend that you'd like to recruit to work with us? You know, internal referrals is something where that's always a positive pathway to pursue because if you have someone who's like-minded and who has similar interests and they could also be a wonderful library worker, then absolutely we should be recruiting internally as well. So looking at all the different ways that we can continue to serve one another is a way that we can diversify and celebrate the strength of that diversity. 
as we have different professions entering into the field, looking, you know, from writing and publishing and researching science, other sciences, it's important that we always look at how we can build those connections and continue to reinforce and strengthen the library and information field. So as we're looking to diversify, it's important that we continue to look internally. Do you already have the staff that is ready for a promotion? Have you as a leader been supporting them and their success and have been continuing to help them grow so that they too can lead within your library? It is really up to us to help diversify this field and to help bring everyone in together in a good way. And so I would encourage leaders to continue to not only tell their own story as to how they found their fit in the library, but encourage others to see themselves working in libraries as well. You have just given us a wonderful opening that gets this very personal. When you talk about the idea of people not perhaps looking at librarianship as a profession, a challenge to all of us is exactly what you just threw out to us to say, how many of us thought when we were five years old, I want to be a librarian? I mean, no, there were so many other things we talked about. And yet it is such a lovely, dynamic, and important profession. So I'd, I'd love to just reiterate what you said and say, all those of you who are watching, students, peers, anybody else, ask yourself, why don't we look at our three, four, and five-year-olds and lay out there the idea that this is one of many, many, many options that we'd be looking at? I think about what Cindy just said about what it does in terms of adding to the diversity of our community, but also making this one of those exciting professions that we all understand and need to share the excitement with others. So thanks, Cindy. That just made me actually sit up even more than I was when we started. And I would like to say as the non-MLS person in the room, that there's also room for those of us who do not have MLSs within the libraries. So you don't have to have an MLS to participate, work for a library. There are many roles that are outside of the library profession that you can help at a library. For example, I am my day job is a trainer. Uh, I'm not an MLS degree librarian, but I am very good friends with lots of MLS degree librarians who are doing great work. Cindy, I want to talk about your work with intellectual freedom, which I think may possibly come up during your, your tenure as American Library Association president. If you could talk about your work with the Freedom to Read Foundation, how you got involved with it. Well, intellectual freedom is something that is very important to me. It's personal. There was a time in this country when the original inhabitants, the indigenous peoples of this land, of these lands, were outlawed from speaking, singing, reading, or writing in our own languages. And when I tell people that, they often you know, they, they give me a curious look or whether that's the first time they've heard it or they think it was a long time ago. I then lead them into the zinger that when my grandparents were born on our reservation in Nebraska, they weren't considered American citizens. And it wasn't until they were five years old that they were finally recognized as American citizens. And that's when they were taken from their homes and placed into residential boarding schools, where they were told, you're no longer Dakota. You do not speak your language. You do not sing your language. You do not write in your language. And do you know when that finally changed, when the final law changed, when we could all sing together again? It was 1978. This was not hundreds of years ago. This wasn't way back when. This wasn't when Native Americans were discovered. This is within our lifetimes. And so it is so important to me that people understand that we do not silence voices in this country. No one's illegal on stolen land. And I know that when I say that, some people don't understand that. But truly, from an Indigenous perspective, why would there ever be a law that tells people they can't be who they are that they're not allowed to communicate in their own language. And so it's so important to me that I will always be the voice, hopefully of reason, for people to understand that there's great value in supporting people in their humanness, helping them be who they are. The creator made us all, put us here with a purpose and a reason. And in my family, that means we speak Dakota and English. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
there's beauty and diversity, and we all have wonderful stories to tell. So for me, intellectual freedom means being an American. It means that everyone has First Amendment rights. It means that everyone is an equal and that you should be able to see your stories of your people on any library shelf in this country. It means that you should be able to read books that are written in your language, that you can speak your language freely in society, and certainly that you can sing the language of your ancestors no matter where you go. Thank you, Cindy, for that answer. That was beautifully done. Uh, so how are students and our colleagues in the information field can become involved in the work of the Freedom to Read Foundation. Um, like yeah, there, most of the students, I remember when I was in library school, I didn't know much about the movement. And uh, I think it, I would have benefited a lot if I had known then. So what do you think um, they, sh they should know and they should do um, as they are still students in library school? Join the Freedom to Read Foundation. It was the best $10 I ever spent. I joined as a student member and I started getting the newsletter and I started following the, the free webinars that they had. I looked at the member resource center and I thought, wow, here it is. I can't believe that all of these resources are available at my fingertips. And I also joined my state association. Again, that was, that was a $10 um, fee for me at that time. And I learned more about their intellectual freedom webinars, e-resources, different um, programs that they offered. So definitely there are a lot of resources available to students and it never hurts to ask. If you need a scholarship to join, please reach out. There is most likely resources available to students to become involved. And we love to see that rep representation. I'm someone who I always love to encourage leaders from any point in their career. And I believe that we're always going to be stronger together. So I encourage anyone to reach out and to use their voice in a good way. As we come towards our end of our time together, first of all, thank you very much for spending this time with us. I'd like to ask you a question. What do you do to maintain your own health and wellness? Well, I am a big bubble bath person, and I have all of those wonderful face masks and bath bombs and all of the fun things that bring me joy. Um, and I also lock the door because when you have multiple children and, and dogs, you just never know who wants to join you. So... For me, just, you know, setting those healthy boundaries, helping people remember, I am a mom, but you know what, I'm also Cindy. And right now I'm going to have Cindy time. <laughs> it's something that's, you know, simple. Um, but I, I do have a bubble bath on a regular basis. So for other health purposes, you know, I make sure that I stay hydrated. I take my vitamins. Um, and so, you know, for the most part, I also remember that I'm a human. I try to remind myself that each and every day that no one should ask more of me than they would ask of themselves. Um, sometimes folks can get real unrealistic when it's your time. <laughs> I have to remind people, I only have the same hours that you do. Um, so, you know, as much as I would love to take on the world and do all the things, um, I, I often need to just uh, take that slower pace and remind myself that it's okay. I can go ahead and put that on a to-do list and not necessarily, you know, forego a bubble bath. So Cindy, thank you so much. We're about at the end of our time here. We just want to thank you for sharing all that you shared with us today and hope that it has a positive transformative influence on the people we're hoping the podcast will reach. Yes. Thank you. It was a pleasure getting to know you, Cindy, and thank you for all for joining us. And thanks to the San Jose State University High School, uh, my alma mater as well. I'm very proud alumna of the program and of the school. So thank you for joining us. And join us next time for the Information Going Wild podcast, where we discuss all things information science. Thank you very much for watching us on YouTube. Please remember to like and subscribe. Have a great day. Thank you.